UNO has always been an expanding university, constantly moving forward. But as we move forward, we must also look back to where we began. Let's go back in time with the people who remember UNO the way it was. Join us for Reflections in Time. It's a beautiful morning, January of 1989, and I'm located in the new Health, Physical Education, and Recreation Faculty Lounge, a beautiful room here on campus, and it's a special pleasure for me and some of our UNO students to be here. We're here to prepare another in the series that are kept in our library and in our alumni house called Reflections in Time. It's a time when we reflect, or our guests reflect, on their life and their life at the university, many of whom have spent 25 and 30 years here with us on campus. It's a series we started some years ago now at the time we recorded in 1989. We have, oh, possibly around 50 hours of videotape in our library, and we're pleased with that. And we're pleased with the man we're going to visit with today, Dr. George Barger. George, I'm glad you could come. He's a professor on our campus and has been for lots of years, teaching a variety of things and also being a man of the cloth. And I think with that dual background, if not some other things I don't know about, I think there are lots we can talk about. First, George, and I've known you for many, many years, I don't really know where George comes from and how it all got started for you. And why don't you go back to being a very little boy okay. and begin from there, if you would. Okay. We'll begin with, with birth. I was born in a little village called Green Valley, just outside of uh, St. Joseph, Missouri. Oh, right here in the Middle West. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a Middle Westerner. Yeah. And I grew up in that area. Uh, my father at that time was working for a bank, but um, uh, during the Depression, uh, we uh, eventually ended up on a farm uh, just north of St. Joseph, and I essentially grew up on a farm, I guess, uh, what used to be called a country club Y. We farmed a, a uh, 200 acres for the president of the Bank of Savannah. There weren't any country schools out there by the time I went to school, so I always went to school in, in St. Joseph to Musser School which is no longer standing, to Bliss Junior High School, which is now a resident home for uh, uh, older folks, and then to Central High School, which is still a, a school. Uh -huh. uh, let's see, I graduated in 1941. I grew up um, thinking I was going to be a musician. I began with the piano first. Oh, you took those piano lessons as a boy. Yes, yes, yes. That took fortitude and a few other things, didn't it? Yes, <laughs> on the part of my mother, yes. Yeah. Then we uh, we switched over. I switched over to uh, trombone in junior high school, and unfortunately dropped a piano. I've al always regretted that, especially now as I wish I could still play. Uh -huh. But uh, I played in uh, the high school orchestra and the high school band. Then we had a dance band and played around the campus kings. Played around St. Joe. Uh, after I graduated from high school, I um, uh, one week after I graduated. I was hurt on our farm. Uh, we were still using horses and were pulling some hay from one end of the barn to the other, and the hay fork got hung up. Uh -huh. We had a little bay mare that wasn't pulling very well then, so I was up tapping her every so often. And um, uh, she gave a lunge and broke the single tree, and of course the double tree came back and knocked me about 40 feet. Uh -huh. And I was put in the hospital. And I mention that because that's how I happened to meet my wife. Uh, <laughs> Helen at that time was a student nurse in Missouri Methodist Hospital, oh, yeah. and we became acquainted while I was in the hospital for about a month and a half, and uh, began to date after that, and eventually I married her. So it was good that you and the single tree and double tree had a little meeting of the minds, yes. huh? Yes. Well, <laughs> yes, uh-huh. In <laughs> retrospect? <laughs> yeah. I became acquainted with uh, what was then OU, as a matter of fact, in 1941-42, uh, uh, when I came up and lived with an aunt and uncle of mine here in Omaha. Oh. and worked at Powers Pharmacy uh, down 24th and Farnham and played in the Omaha Symphony. I um, see Richard Duncan was the uh, conductor at that time. Yes. I think they were just kind of getting the thing started again, and I played second trombone with them for a season. Uh, you were a young man the then, weren't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, I had a, I was a pretty good trombonist at that time. Uh -huh. Then I went to Kansas University for a semester. I was going to ask you, while you were here and working in the drugstore and playing in the symphony and living with your relatives, uh -huh. did you see the campus? 
You know, I don't remember it very well. I wondered I if you'd seen it and had a memory of it. Yeah, yeah. that's the way with me. Yeah. I remember the streetcar turned around out here. This was really part of the edge of, edge of town. town yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was nothing yeah. but farm uh, land on yeah. west of us. And the streetcar turned around here, and uh, uh, and I remember we practiced in what is now the uh, the theater. That was the auditorium and yeah. a little bit of everything at the time. Eating, but, uh, dancing, everything yeah. took place there. I just have vague recollections yeah. of all that, yeah. to tell you the truth. Okay, now back to, to your... I, I let well, you leave town, and then I took you back. Now, you went I, back to service. I, uh, I worked for Mutual of Omaha for about six months, too, while I was still in Omaha, and then went into the Air Force. I... Uh, I uh, was in the uh, Air Force for uh, three years uh, during the Second World War. I mm -hmm. was trained as a bombardier navigator. And, uh, through where did you do your training? Where, where did you do your training? Well, let's see. Uh, first at Collegeville, Minnesota at St. John's University. Oh, yeah. And then I went out Were you to part of one of those programs, V-5? Yeah. Not V-5. They or called seven it or whatever. Uh, college Training Detachment, but ah. the same kind of thing. Yeah. You know. And then I went to Santa Ana, California at the Air Force Base there for my pre-flight. Took my gunnery training at Las Vegas, and my bombardier navigator training at Albuquerque, New Mexico. The interesting thing about those is that they were both just little kind of sleepy country towns then. And of mm -hmm. course, they've really exploded since, oh, the, yeah. uh, since the 40s. I flew with the Eighth Air Force. I flew 33 missions in um, uh, B-24s, which at that time was called a heavy bomber. It's uh, not much of a heavy bomber compared to the ones they have now. No. But most of my missions were over Germany. There were two or three over France, but uh, most of them were, were over Germany. Uh, then I came back and... Um, Let's pause there for a minute. Mm -hmm. the, the missions. I was in World War II also, but I wasn't in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. I would think that part of your life, the missions over Europe, would be a real pressure cooker for a young man. Yeah, it took a while to get over it when I got back. Uh, uh -huh. I had... Uh, I do remember that. Um, one of the things, you know, that I've noticed in teaching here, and it really blows my mind every time it... Uh, occasionally I'll mention the Second World War yeah. as an illustration or something in class, and it uh, always intrigues me that uh, for most of my students, you know, that's ancient history, <laughs> and it's still very alive. You know, it's something that I happened sure. and so on, lived through. Sure. So it uh, shows you how quickly things become history these yes, days, indeed. I guess. But. Uh, <laughs> uh, even the even the Vietnam War is for many of our students just kind of ancient history. Oh now. yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Well, let's see. After after the war, oh, during the war, I married uh, my wife Helen. Oh, you and Helen married during the war. Yeah, when she uh, graduated from nurses training in 1943, we were married just before I went to bombardier school, and she went along and worked at uh, uh, Albuquerque in the Presbyterian Hospital there uh -huh. until I went overseas. I was overseas about a year. I came back, and by then, uh, let's see, I came back in June of 1945, and of course the war ended, ended uh, shortly, shortly after, after the that. The European War, yeah. So instead of going on to the Southwest Pacific, I was discharged. We, they were given a choice, and I, I knew that I didn't want to stay in the Army. No. So um, I came back, and at that time I decided to become a uh, theological student oh. and enter the Christian ministry. Any special thing that occurred in your life or things that uh, no, moved you in that direction, George? Not that I can put a finger on, no. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I keep looking for those kind of explanations, but I'm not much given, I guess, to psychological explanations. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, you know, my mother died when I was uh, 14. Uh, I don't know whether that influenced it. I don't know whether the war influenced it. Uh, it was something I thought I wanted to do and did, as a matter of fact, for 18 years. I went to Butler University in Indianapolis, oh, and because right. they had a theological school in connection with it, oh, did they? and took my theological training as well as finished my undergraduate training there too. A couple of famous men from our campus came from there, if you recall. Yes, yes, Dr. Bale and Dr. Gorman. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know that, but I know uh, I knew that Dr. Bale was Bale there. there at the time you were there. Yes, I think he came to uh, OU shortly after. Uh, see, I was there in forty began in 46, uh -huh. so I think he was still there maybe for a year before mm -hmm. he came back to, uh, to OU. Um, Had you finished your d undergraduate degree w while you were in the Air Force program, or did you do that after the war? No, I got about maybe a year's credit for the different things that we had, and it enabled me to hurry up through college. I, w I ought to say here that uh, I'm very grateful to the um, uh, GI Bill. There Amen. wasn't any way at all I could have gone to college if it had not been for some kind. Of, and, of course, there weren't many scholarships available no, then. No. 
So if it hadn't been for the GI Bill, I'd probably have been back on the farm. That's, uh, there wasn't any way at all I could imagine college. That changed a lot of people's lives, yes, that Yes, it really bill. did. It really did. So let's see, I gra got my AB in 48 and my um, uh, BD in 50 and my MA in 1952, all of them from Butler University. Oh, you in really were a long time, comp you, you well, really were studenting then, weren't you? Well, wow. part of those last two years, I was an assistant uh, minister uh, at uh, a church in Indianapolis, so it enabled me to go on back and finish my master's. Oh, I see. Then I went to Ann Arbor, Michigan. That was my first parish that I had. And while there, I decided to pursue a doctorate. I was going to be an archaeologist, I thought, in Near Eastern Studies. Ah. And I got about, I think, 30, 33 hours uh, towards my doctorate uh, at um, uh, Michigan. And then for various reasons, mostly family reasons, uh, we wanted to get closer to our parents and so on, both Helen's parents, who lived in Auburn, Nebraska, and my father was still in St. Joe, Missouri. Uh -huh. We thought we'd better get b back closer to them, and it uh, turned out it was a good thing that we did because uh, Helen's father did not live too much longer after that. But in, in any case, I moved to Maryville, Missouri, and had a parish there for three years. Still stuck in my craw that I didn't have a doctorate yet. I wanted to get that. <laughs> so um, we uh, moved to Boonville, Missouri, and I commuted back and forth then to the University of Missouri and finished my uh, doctorate in 1964 at the University of Missouri, and I had a parish in Boonville, Missouri at the time. Now, I should have mentioned somewhere along in here that um, in between these times, we had our four children. We had a, a daughter born in uh, 1946, and then a son born in 49, uh -huh. and then two more daughters, one in 1952 and one in 1955. And um, that was one of the occasions. The reason I mentioned that, because that will lead me into the next thing, how did I become a teacher? That's I the question I often ask, and you're moving right in. That's yeah, fine. I um, <laughs> got my doctorate in 60. I was actually awarded in the spring of 65. I finished my work in the spring of 64. Uh -huh. And at that time, my oldest daughter was graduating from high school. And um, ministerial salaries being what they were at that particular time, and uh, uh, it was clear to me that I couldn't afford to send her to college. So we had an opportunity, I had an opportunity at, uh, to go to Elmhurst College in Elmhurst, Illinois, oh, and one of the fringe benefits school. there was that you, your children could attend school uh, tuition free. So that seemed to be a pretty good uh, offer, and we moved to Elmhurst then, and lived there for three years while my oldest daughter was indeed attending school uh, there. It's a nice little college, it's, uh, we have about, it had about 1,500 day students and about the same number of night students at uh, Elmhurst. I like the uh, the intimacy of the campus. It's a small campus. Uh -huh. uh, looks like a campus. It's a beautiful little area. And a good uh, undergraduate uh, associated at that time with the Evangelical Reformed Church. They're uh -huh. now UCCs. Uh -huh. And many of their students would go on down to Eden Seminary then in St. Louis to finish their uh, theological work. But in any case, I taught there for these three years. What and sorts of things did you teach there, theologically I was, uh, related no, things? No, no, all of my teaching, I should have mentioned that, all of my teaching has been in social psychology oh, and sociology. Oh. Uh, I, that's what I took my doctorate in. Yeah. And uh, planned on staying in parish work, uh, at least I thought I did when I uh, was taking the work, but mm -hmm. as I said, it uh, was very useful to, to begin to teach. Found out I like teaching. It's a lot like preaching when you get right down to it. You've got a group of people there who are, <laughs> in a sense, a captive audience. Yeah. And they very seldom raise questions, as the <laughs> same thing happens during, uh, during a sermon and so on. So it's just a different topic, but the same uh, uh, talking style. Let's see, now that brings me to 1967. Uh -huh. Now we're and, getting closer to Omaha. Yeah, but. well, Helen's mother's health, uh, my wife's mother's health was uh, very poor at this particular time. She was out at Auburn. Yeah, she lived at Auburn, huh. and once again, uh, we thought, well, maybe she can come back and live with us, but uh, Elmhurst is a very expensive kind of suburban town, uh, kind of a bedroom community in relation to Chicago, mm -hmm. and I couldn't afford a, a home there that would be big enough for Maud, Helen's mother, to live with us, so we said, well, why don't we look around back in this area? Uh -huh. And uh, George Helling, uh, uh, well, a friend of mine at University of Missouri sent my name to George, and George was the chairman of the department at that time. Mm -hmm. And he came back and was interviewed and then was hired uh, for Omaha University in the uh, started the fall of 1967. Just a Omaha. little while before the merger you came, Just really. Just a year. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We were right in the middle of uh, the campaign. I remember walking around and handing out pamphlets and uh, 
doing uh, various kinds of... Uh, the Middle Levy campaign? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, and yeah. worked in all that. Yeah. I've always uh, enjoyed working in kind of political areas and uh, had a good time at that. And then, of course, that December, I guess, was or the next January, was when the bill passed that we were going to become a uh, part of the state mm -hmm. university. I was going to ask you, as you came to campus, I don't know, you came back here mm -hmm. to live and to work, mm -hmm. uh, what was the place like at that time in your memory? It didn't look much like a college campus, quite <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Coming from Elmhurst, it didn't look quite no, the same, did it? No, it didn't. Uh, at that time, I believe we had the uh, just the old, the old administration building, yeah, the original yeah, building, yeah. and then the um, gym, Back behind the administration building, there was a uh, Nissan hut of some sort that was served as the student union. Uh, and then, of course, we had the new student union that had just been recently built. Right, right. And those were all the buildings, I believe, w that yeah. we had on campus. There was a lot of greenery around. Lots a lot of, of greenery. We had a lot of those uh, tin affairs that yeah, we had. Temporary permanent Temporary buildings. permanent that we <laughs> tore down just last year. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I came as a as an a, uh, associate professor of sociology. How big was the department when George hired you? Uh, there were well, let's see. I can I can name them. Uh, there was George. There was um, uh, Pete Kuchel. Oh yeah. Teaching uh, their criminology courses. Elaine Hess. Mm -hmm. And Ken Root. And that was the de and myself. And, and two of them the are department. still here. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And uh, Wayne Wheeler, who came at the same time oh, that I yeah. did, was uh, but came as head of the um, what is now um, uh, what do they call this in the unit that's down uh, down uh, town. It's uh, oh, I can't think of it. Does economic uh, yeah. investigations I and know. so on? Uh, I'll think of it maybe right. pretty soon. Right. Anyhow, Wayne came as as the head of that uh -huh. and as acting chair of the department because uh, the year I came, George was in Turkey doing some of his research. He came back the next year and, uh, for various reasons, decided to leave after mm -hmm. that year. So I became, uh, I was elected chairman of the department then after George left. Gee, you hadn't been here long. You became chair of the department. Well, it was small. Yeah. You see, yeah. And it, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't hard to work up in those days. <laughs> uh, we still had Ken. Uh, let's see, Elaine left that year, I believe, to go work on her doctorate at uh, NU uh -huh. and then took a, a job up in South Dakota. Uh, Wayne came into the department as a teacher, and that was the time when the department was growing very rapidly, as indeed the school was growing yeah. very rapidly. Because I was wondering how big it was when you came here. Do you recall, the you know, school? in terms of size as a university, were we? In terms of figures, no, I don't know how many. But it must have been half of the 15,000 we have now. Or I less. think we had around uh, maybe 8,000 yeah. total students, yeah. and maybe half of those were full time and half were part time, right. something like that. Right. Our teaching hours at that time, we began with 12 hours, but when we became a part of the state, then we had the, the present nine hour with three hours for research mm -hmm. as the customary full-time load. Now, let's see, I was chairman for nine and a half years and then uh, gave that up in 1978. And during that time, things grew and changed, didn't they? Oh, yes. Yeah, the yeah. school really did grow. We built several buildings. Uh, move the library. Uh, our department moved two or three times. When I first came here, we were in the engineering building over right. near right next to me, near you, and <laughs> uh, right around the corner from economics. Right. Um, then uh, we moved to what was called the library office annex, and were there several oh, yeah. years uh, yeah. in what was then the Epley Library, what right. is now our Epley Conference or Epley uh, Administration Building, and uh, we were in the part where the um, uh, registrar and uh, those other offices are. They've mm -hmm. torn all the, the partitions out and made a big room out of it. But that became an administrative building generally. Now. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then they finally moved us, to, moved us over to where we are now in the uh, administration. In the used to be the administration building. Now it's the Arts and Science Building. Uh, and at the time when I came here, that was where Dean Utley and the um, uh, College of Continuing Studies, Studies were located. So we've, <laughs> we've done a lot of shifting of buildings around here and, and offices. And let's see, then, um, you know, I suppose I better get into what I've been teaching. Yeah, I was wondering, if, for example, as you began here, George, I began and as here, you continue, and you, the okay. things you taught, and how the progression of curriculum might have changed a bit or expanded over those years, those many years, both as a department head and as a teacher. Okay. Uh, I began teaching the introductory class 
and I pretty much taught that my entire career here, at least one section of it, either day or night. Uh, my major teaching area was social psychology, and I have taught that every semester that I've been here at the oh, university, right? at least one section of social psych. Uh, in addition to that, I've taught in the area of sociology of religion. I've taught the theory courses. I taught the stat courses for several years. After Elaine left, she had uh, taught our stat courses. And I was the only one that could teach them then for what well, must have been five or six or seven years, I guess. I mm -hmm. taught statistics, usually in those little tin buildings. Uh, I remember... Uh, Bad place to be in a hailstorm. Yes, very <laughs> noisy. I, it was hard to make yourself heard. And always rather noisy, yeah. Yeah, always, always. Uh, one of the things I remember most about that is that the present um, dean of the uh, Clarkson Hospital College of Nursing, uh, Pat Perry, was a student my first semester of teaching uh, stat. Oh, is that And right? she and I often laugh about that. We had a great time in that particular class. Let's see. Uh, in addition to that, I've taught graduate courses uh, mainly in theory and in social psychology. Graduate seminars have been the two areas that I've uh, handled graduate seminars. Um, graduate study, was that a part of the curriculum as you began or was that yeah. added later? We've always offered a master's uh -huh. since I've been here mm -hmm. in so sociology. I think that happened back uh, when uh, Dr. Sullinger yes, was still so. uh, in the department. Became acquainted, I ought to mention Dr. Sullinger, I became acquainted with him um, as I became chairman because uh, he gave us our basic departmental library. We call it the Sullinger Memorial Library, as a matter of fact. And um, he gave us uh, most of his library, and we just moved it over here to school then. Fine gentleman. Yes, a very nice I man. Him. Yes, he was. Um, let's see, that's pretty much what I've taught. I've served on a great many of the committees, uh, department chairmen are quite often asked to serve on committees, and uh, I guess two of the ones that I'm most pleased of having served on, I was on a, a committee that uh, helped start the KVNO radio. Uh, whenever that was, I no longer remember when it's it was. It's about 15 but, years ago okay. more, yeah. Well, I remember we, uh, I was on that committee that helped get that thing yeah, started. and that's been a growing and improving thing oh, all yes. the time. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm very pleased with that. And then um, I was also on the, the committee that uh, helped start uh, the College of, uh, move the College of Continuing Studies into um, CPACs mm -hmm. uh, now. And very much, uh, I'm very pleased that we did that. I, I think here I would mention the fact, the person I, uh, you think about who is the person that you most remember in your years out here at school. And I think I would remember best Hubert Locke. He um, was the first chairman of, uh, or first dean of CPACs. Yes and just a tremendous person in my opinion. I thought it was a real loss when we, uh, when he moved from uh, UNO to, uh, out to Seattle, I mm -hmm. think it is. But um, he got so many things going for us on campus. He started our overseas program. Uh, he uh, began our first uh, real involvement in the, in the community uh, as a university, and uh, I really hate to see him leave. I still miss uh, Hubert. Mm -hmm. um, uh, other people, however, that I remember very well on campus, and I suppose I should mention some of these. Um, we've had some awfully good teachers. One of the things that I would uh, certainly say that has impressed me about both OU and UNO, as we've uh, we've had, I guess I'd say it this way, better teachers than we deserve uh, in terms of uh, some of the, uh, especially some of the salaries when, yes. when we were still OU, and it hasn't, it, it's grown as a, a state school, but uh, not as one would hope that it would have. But uh, when I came here, we had at least three just outstanding teachers. Uh, Ralph Wordle was one of them, certainly, and Stanley Trickett in history. And I always smile when I think of Stanley because uh, in our <laughs> department, in our um, college meetings, uh, you could always count on him to make some kind of a, of a florid speech of some sort. You'd he, know he Stanley was language. there at any yes, meeting. He had a real gift for language. <laughs> and then... Um, He's still on campus, as a matter of fact, Orville Menard, yes. who I think is uh, just a, an outstanding teacher. He's um, one who has uh, really deserved that outstanding teacher award. I believe he, he was our first or second. There was a young man in philosophy who is yeah. no longer here who got it, too, and I can't remember which was first. But well, Orville was very early on yeah. in that uh -huh. new yeah. awarding, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, the campus has changed a great deal since I came here, of course, not merely in terms of buildings. We look like a college campus now. Yeah, it's changed since you came, hasn't it? It's very it? satisfying, <laughs> yeah. This, uh, this tower that we've added uh, 
it's it's a frill, but my, it's a lovely uh, frill that we've added, and and uh, kind of in a sense completes uh, yeah. the look of our campus. And it's, it's sort of uh, a beacon. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't live too far from campus here, and I can see the tower from uh, from my home. I haven't heard it yet. I don't know whether I can hear it or not, but I can at least see it. Um, so in terms of buildings, we've got a much more adequate campus than we had when I came here. Uh, strangely enough, our classroom situation is uh, that is for in simple instruction uh, classroom situation has not improved all that much. Uh, we're still very traditional in the kinds of classrooms that we build here, and in far too many of our classrooms, in my opinion, the chairs are fastened down. You can't move them, so that almost inevitably coerces a person into being a lecturer rather yeah. than a, a, uh, a discussion group leader. The environment sets the tone for what you might try to do. Yes, it does. I, uh, I would hope that uh, if any buildings we build in the future would show a little bit more imagination on the part of the architect and uh, give us some flexible classrooms, yeah. Um, not merely buildings, but of course, goodness, the number of students that, uh, yeah. that we have um, has more than doubled, I, I, uh, I'm sure, since uh, I came here, both in, in part-time students and in full-time students. Um, I was wondering, as you talk about the student church, uh, those are the reasons why we're here and have uh -huh. been here generally over the years, and I wondered <coughs> if you... Uh, as you look back on all the hundreds of students that you have touched academically, uh, as the, the student profile of the kinds of students we've attracted to this university, if they're the same as they were in the early and mid-60s, or if they're a little different now, uh, take, a, take a look at them back then and now, if you would. And okay, this will be just impressions. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Sure. No, our student body is quite different than it was in the 19, uh, in the, when I first came here in the, in the late 60s and up to, let's say, the mid-70s. Uh, then we had a very large, uh, what were called bootstraps, mm -hmm. our uh, military personnel who would come here for schooling. Uh, at that time, the Vietnam War was going on, uh, and a great many uh, of our military personnel came here and uh, finished their undergraduate work and, uh, and went on back to service. Uh, we had a, a younger student body then, not if you don't count the, the military personnel. Mm -hmm. And my, we must have had 1,200, 1,500 of those fellows at times uh, here on campus. A large, a large group, group I large know. Group. Um, we had a younger student body then. One of the inter interesting things to me that has happened on this campus is that our uh, uh, modal age has uh, increased. Uh, at that time, it was the um, Vietnam, uh, the military people who brought a, a kind of a different tone to the campus. I, w I would say a, a different kind of maturity. Now, it's the fact that, uh, well, two things. One of them, our student body is older. We're getting an awful lot of, um, of uh, ladies who um, are coming back to finish their college careers. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, well, the, the, the profile that uh, is being found in many places, but particularly here at UNO, uh, women who interrupted their college careers in order to marry, uh, have their children, and now that the children have uh, left high school, uh, they're ready to come back, and uh, it's a part of the, the general re-entry of uh, many women into, uh, into the, the work world and uh, leaving the home and entering the work world. The other thing, and e to me equally important uh, thing that's happening here, is that we've gotten a much more international student body uh, yeah. We have more international students here than uh, right now than, my goodness, we've ever had. That began sometime in the 1960s when we began, began to get a lot of African students here. Uh, I remember one young man uh, from uh, Nigeria who was here at the time of the Nigerian Civil War working on his master's in, uh, in Soch and who had to go back, was called back by uh, his government or his family and um, the thing I remember best about him, he was such a fine soccer player. Uh -huh. He had played on the Nigerian uh, national team and uh, was an awfully good student, and I hated to see him go back, but he felt like he had to. So we've had a good many African students. Now we've moved uh, from, uh, we still get a few, but uh, we're getting more, then we moved into the Near East mm -hmm. and got quite a few Near Eastern students for a while. Yes, now we did. South American and Far Eastern, it seems to be at the present time. But these students bring a, a, uh, a richness to our campus that uh, I think is very good for the rest of the student body. I, I hope they get acquainted with one another uh, while they're here because uh, uh, not many Midwestern 
urban universities uh, get as ma I don't think as many international students. That's probably partly uh, Tom's uh, yeah. work. Uh, Tom Boudier in yes, that area uh, of our international student group. Yeah. He's done a great job of mm -hmm. drawing for a variety of reasons students here. We have the Aluna program, of course, where they study language and for other reasons too. Um, the um, one other thing I'd like to say about student body. Yeah. Um, during the 1960s, people always, uh, that was, of course, when we had so much uh, student uh, unrest at various campuses. We didn't have any of that here. Very little. And uh, I don't, I wish I would remember the student who, he was uh, very active in um, the student council at this time and so on. But somebody asked him once why it was that uh, UNO students were not more restive than they were. He says, well, it's awfully hard to be a radical when you go home to mother every night. <laughs> and I think that, uh, <laughs> That's an interesting feature of our campus. Namely, we are a completely commuter campus. We don't have any resident uh, halls. It means we've got a different kind of campus here, a kind of campus that uh, the rest of the state, in my opinion, has a, a good deal of difficulty understanding uh, what is peculiar and uh, unique in terms of problems so far as our campus is concerned. Uh, it's been fairly consistent since I've been here that about three out of every four of our students work yes. at least part-time. I don't think that's varied a bit in the last 30 years, have I don't think very much, no. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, this means, amongst other things, that whatever the student does, they do while they're on campus, and then they leave and they don't come back. Uh, we haven't had, in most of our departments at least, much success in uh, extracurricular student activities. Uh, we don't have a tremendous amount of campus spirit, for example. We don't have big pep rallies and this sort of thing, such as I remember from Kansas University and from Butler and also from Michigan. But all those are residence campuses. And this makes quite a difference, I think. Oh, yeah. It also means that our students, uh, in, in many ways, our students' first commitment is not to college. It's, it's to the job. And uh, yes, I'm going to college because I want to improve uh, my, my self on the job and so on. It, uh, it means that in, in some senses, the, uh, the uh, give and take, which uh, could be a part of uh, campus life, uh, the intellectual challenges and so on, are not so, as a, so apparent here on the UNO campus. It means that the teacher has to work harder at uh, challenging students, at uh, 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 in a sense almost forcing them to wrestle with ideas and so on. Because when you go from here to, a, to your work, uh, that's where your ideas are, and you're not spending a lot of time reflecting on the, the, you know, the latest uh, uh, philosophical opinion or the, the latest uh, theoretical uh, approach in, in whatever it happens to be. Yeah, you're really busy in a couple of worlds, then. Yeah, yeah. uh-huh. Yeah. They're in two worlds, rather than in a, in a uh, uh, residential campus. Students put it on campus. Uh, you know, he's... Uh, uh, all the time, and if he's not on campus, he's with a bunch of other students and so on, and that's not true of ours. They, right. they separate from, from the student body when they, when they leave here. I think it makes a different kind of student. It makes a different kind of college atmosphere, and one which um, uh, puzzles a lot of teachers when they first come here, and uh, uh, still puzzles me at times. <laughs> you know, how, do, how, do you get, uh, how do you get people to, to be, want to wrestle with ideas and so on? Because uh, this is probably the last time, it's indeed the, probably the last time that most of our students will have any opportunity to wrestle with just ideas in a, in a just kind of an abstract sense. Uh, once they leave here, they're going to be in the applied world of, of business and finance and teaching, whatever it happens to be. And the plain fact is we know that once people leave college, uh, most of them are going to stop reading. <clears throat> They'll fall back into the, the mode for the country of about a book and a half a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it would be nice if we could figure out <clears throat> some way to, um, to make this a little bit more of an uh, intellectual atmosphere while they're here. But quite frankly, uh, I don't have the answer to that question. It's, it's part of the problem of an urban university. It's one of the, the great things about an urban university is that you are so close to the, to the real world, but it's also one of the, the baffling aspects of, mm -hmm. uh, of an urban university. I think what you've been describing here is an interesting observation on our student body. And in summation, it's probably that <clears throat> the students aren't intentionally any different, but the environment makes them so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really. Once again, it's, it's the, <clears throat> just we, we said earlier that you, you tend to lecture on this campus because that's the way the rooms are set up with immovable chairs and so on. And uh, it takes an effort not to lecture in a classroom like that. You have to, to plan. How can I get students to talk to one another when they're really looking at one another's backs and so on? And the, the, I believe the, <coughs> the, uh, the environment also, in a sense, uh, constricts, or at least restricts, 
uh, some of the uh, developmental uh, intellectual life of the, of the university here as well. Now let's see. I've talked about uh, me. I've <laughs> talked about uh, the university. One thing I wanted to ask you along these lines, as we've talked to you, Drifted, you indicated you came to the university really uh, not too long before the merger. Mm -hmm. Well, that was quite a big thing in the life of the faculty and mm -hmm. the staff here, and also, I guess, along the line, the students, too. Perhaps they didn't notice it quite as much. Mm -hmm. But you were here sort of toward the last of the municipal life university. But I was interested in any observations you might make on that move into the merger and what it seemed to do or be for us as a campus. Yeah, it's easy to... Um it's easy to dwell on the, on the negative aspects of that, and I, w I do want to talk about those a little bit. But I ought to begin with the positive aspects. It's certainly give us better, given us better resources. We were pretty much at the end of our resources It was uh, when we became a state university. It was pretty obvious the city did not want to, uh, the, the public, did not want to contribute a great deal more in terms of the mill no. levy for a university. No. And that meant that our, our potential was uh, going to be fairly well limited and fairly quickly. So one of the things that the merger did is that it gave us a, a freedom that we wouldn't have had, it seems to me, and that's a very positive thing. It's given us uh, financial support that uh, we wouldn't have had. Uh, we couldn't have built the buildings. We couldn't have developed the computer support um, and uh, the library support and all that we've had, uh, which make us a, a good university. Uh, I guess the things that uh, I find most impressive about it, however, I would have to call negative aspects. Uh, one of the things that's done is certainly impersonalized our campus. When I um, came to this school, within about the first seven or eight months, I think I knew most of the faculty uh, by last name, if not by first name. Mm -hmm. uh, we met together uh, regularly as, a, as an entire college faculty, a university faculty, not just by uh, the colleges and so on. And we did become very well acquainted with one another, uh, knew what the other person was doing, uh, uh, we had a faculty dining room at that time and um, where we could sit and chat with one another. And uh, I felt the, uh, the, at least the, the faculty interaction was a very positive thing at that, at that sort. Most of the faculty that I still know are people that I met back then. Yeah. Now our faculty, I don't know how lot large it was then, uh, perhaps uh, 150, I'm not sure. Paul. I would say under 200, certainly. Yeah, uh-huh. Now we're over 400, and uh, we no longer meet together as a faculty. Uh, the the so-called all-university meetings are certainly not very well attended. No. And um, we meet as a College of Arts and Sciences or the other colleges. Uh, the graduate faculty uh, meet, uh, but once again, <laughs> they're not too well attended, I'll have to uh, say. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of uh, faculty members are fairly anonymous to one another outside of your own department, it seems to me. Uh, most of the people I still speak to on campus are ones that I knew back uh, when we were meeting as a university uh, faculty. And it's much more difficult to meet the new faculty, uh, become acquainted with them and what their interests are and so on. And I do miss that. I don't, we don't have the give and take that we once had, it seems to me. No. I think, too, that uh, in terms of just, uh, once again, uh, it's, it's a matter of environment. The more people you have, the greater the pressures towards... Uh, um, in personality and so on, we're much more bureaucratically structured now at the university. Uh, when uh, during the first few years I was here, registration was handled by each department. We'd get together in a in a room over in uh, what is now the Arts and Science Building or the other buildings. And unfortunately, the student had to chase all over campus to find his uh, cards. But it did uh, give us a chance to meet the students yeah. and so on uh, prior to class. And Again, a that. personal thing. Yes. Uh huh. And once, now again, once again, I, I suppose it's easier for the student, but to, through the computer and whatnot. But it does mean I don't meet the students, and especially in the large introductory classes, uh, I will not get to know them uh, unless they make a point of coming by the office and introducing themselves and getting acquainted. I try to remember to tell them that. Um, I said that I've taught 101, which usually runs around uh, 350 students in the morning classes, and somewhere between 200 and 300 in the afternoon classes. And uh, there isn't any way at all you can get to know that many students. Uh, uh, that's over 500, 600 students in, in just two classes. There's no way you can get to know them as an individual. And that's too bad because um, it, it means that, that it's very easy for a student to get lost out here. Yeah. Uh, so much of the initiative for uh, becoming personally involved and so on rests on them. 
and coming from high school, many of them come from high schools where just the opposite is the case, where the teachers, the faculty, the administration, and so on, uh, do identify the person, the people, as, uh, as individuals, and then put them in this kind of environment where they're no longer individuals unless they push themselves out to be recognized. Uh, I think it, um, probably that's another one of the, uh, of the problems we have to always be aware of out at uh, a large uh, college campus mm -hmm. such as ours. Um, it, I knew when I first came here, if I ran into a problem, I knew that the person I could call about that. Uh, if I had a registrar problem, I'd call Virgil Sharp. If I had uh, a uh, problem about the classroom, I'd call Jane Kemp, and, and uh, so on down the line, uh, including the library. Nowadays, uh, and this has been true for several years now, when you run into these kinds of problems, well, the first thing you do is you talk to a secretary, <laughs> and uh, she will make an appointment for you, or she will say, well, we don't handle that. And, uh, Anymore. <laughs> yes, and unfortunately, too many times that ends it. Uh, the secretaries are not particularly interested in finding out what you do. Well, what, where do I go now? Well, I'm not sure. And so uh, it, uh, it does impersonalize the campus a great deal. Um, we have a, a fairly rapid turnover of, of secretaries and so on out here, so it's difficult for the new secretary to become acquainted with all the things that she needs to know. I don't know whether you remember Sophie Katz, who was oh, uh, indeed. Everyone our, remember uh, Sophie, our secretary <laughs> in, in sociology for a good many years, and then she moved over to personnel, I think it was, for a while. Yeah. But uh, uh, Sophie, uh, whatever question you had, uh, she'd, if she didn't know the answer, she'd find, find it, it and get back to you. And uh, it's that kind of change that has taken place, and I call it a, a bureaucratic change. Um, really, walking around campus, uh, when we were a smaller school, you would see most of the administrators and so on. I can go for semesters now and uh, really not see any of the administrators uh, unless I happen to go up on the second floor of the Atley Building. Mm -hmm. And it does make for a more impersonal campus. Isn't that a, just an inevitable part of growth and yes. change, almost? Uh, unless you really spend a lot of time and a lot of effort uh, combating it, uh, you do have to, to build structures that will combat this. Because uh, just sheer number, sure. We talk about the same thing in, in, in our urban sociology classes, uh, that uh, urban areas are more impersonal than rural areas, and they are. So I think what you've said here, George, is that really in the merger and the growth, tremendous growth and change, we've lost much of the personal quality we had both among faculty but and between faculty, students, and staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I miss that. Uh huh. Yeah. It. Uh, one of the things I noticed most when I even when I came here from Elmhurst was, uh, as I we had around 1,500 day students there, and I guess at the end of the first year I knew most of them because I'd had most of them in class and uh, uh, they knew me and uh, they it felt like they could drop in to chat and so on. Uh, it, it that happens here on this campus, <clears throat> but it's not so frequent, and in terms of the total student body, it involves of course many fewer students. Uh, let's see. What else should I talk about here? Well, uh, I was wondering, too, uh, you made some interesting observations there about the bigness of the place and the loss of identity, really, mm -hmm. among at least shy and withdrawing students and along yep. with others. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were in charge of this or another university of its size, what would you as a sociologist like to do to see that change? Maybe there are some things that could be effective. Well, yeah, I have thought about that, and they're not, they're not, uh, it's not an easy change to make. No. Uh, because we're working with two different things here. We're working with a non-resident campus. Yeah. Uh, which means that we only have the student to work with when they're actually on campus, usually for classes. And they, they do resist coming back for other, for other meetings. Uh, I think you go to the, to some of our sports events as well. Yeah. And even here, our attendance is really nothing to write home about. No. And that's pretty unusual for college campuses, but I think it, it is because uh, most of our students uh, are involved in other affairs. Yes. So it is a tough uh, kind of question. I think it's uh, mainly, uh, I would begin with just simply consciousness raising, that is reminding our faculty uh, and our administrators that this is the kind of campus that we are. And so uh, pay attention, uh, be aware of this, uh, be sensitive to the fact and um, uh, be uh, as open as you possibly can be to um, uh, acquaintanceship and to contact with students. And I think something else <clears throat> that I would um, probably do, I would reinstitute the uh, faculty dining room 
where faculty can meet just with faculty. I hardly agree. Yeah, and uh, talk to one another. It, uh, it's not that I want to be exclusive. No. Uh, I, we, we, we changed all this back in the 60s, of course, when there was, uh, in the 70s, when there was such a pressure against uh, elitism on campus and whatnot, mm -hmm. and uh, students would get organized for this, that, or the other thing, and that's one of the things that changes that we made. It's also when we lost our name, the uh, OUN dens and mm -hmm. so on. Um, but um, one, of the, um, one of the things that would, would be helpful, I think, is if faculty could at least have a lunch hour where they, if they wanted to, they could meet together in a uh, in a dining room of their own. We used to have some great discussions mm. in the faculty exactly. club room, didn't we? Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. An interaction there that you just didn't get anywhere else. Uh -uh. No. no. And there isn't any, there isn't any place for it anymore. No, not uh -uh. really. Not Even really. the uh, the so-called uh, faculty um, uh, lounge rooms in the various uh, points in the campus are, are really open to anybody yeah. who wants to use them. Yeah. yeah, we don't have a place where we can uh, meet informally. And that would be useful too, it seems to me. Once again, not to exclude students, but to encourage faculty. One of the things I wanted to ask you, George, you've covered a lot of territory here very nicely all over the years about yourself and students, the campus, the growth, the change. But I think you'd agree with me, and you've said that really, I think. It's the people that make the difference on any campus. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned some of the people that stand out in your memory. And uh, on these tapes, I like to have people like yourself share other people on the tape, whom you feel have made a great contribution, not only to you, but to our university, that have helped make it what it is today, for better or worse, larger or smaller, whatever. Who are some of the people that just jump out at you when you think back? Well, who have made uh, the most important contribution to the university, huh? Or that well, personally were of yeah. help to you and so on, anything like that. I guess I would want to say here, uh, really, because I, I very sincerely believe this, that uh, President Roskin, when he was chancellor here, mm -hmm. was a very important uh, factor for our university. I do think that uh, that uh, uh, Ch Chancellor Roskins, I keep getting these, uh, these yeah, the titles, two terms shifting are titles mixed up, <laughs> that Chancellor Roskins was an awfully good uh, chancellor for our campus. Um, and I, I want to emphasize that. Well, he was the, the chancellor here. Mm -hmm. Uh, he um, was able to attract uh, very good administrative help. Uh, he projected a good image uh, so far as the campus was concerned. Uh, he uh, got, began to get us involved in the, in the um, uh, community uh, in ways that we, at least when I first came here, it did not seem like we were involved and so on. He, we became better known. Uh, I think uh, that in many ways Chancellor Weber has uh, 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 continued that, though his style is certainly a great deal different from Ron's. Um, mm -hmm. So that's somebody I would want to mention. I think uh, the others that I remember, you know, best are, are other teachers with whom I've been associated. Yeah. Uh, I've uh, uh, enjoyed many people in the psychology department, served on several uh, master's committees and so on with them. While I was chairman, I got to know uh, many of the other uh, chairmen fairly well. And uh, oh, like you, Cowden, mm -hmm. uh, I've enjoyed him a great deal. Gosh, I've got to know you real well, Paul. Yes. Uh, during uh, this period, um, I uh, was trying to think of who. I'm, I suppose Ralph Wardle and uh, Orv Menard, whom I've already mentioned, yeah. are the people that uh, most impressed me as teachers, and as um, uh, you know, people who are committed to this university and to excellence at this university. Now, I'm sure there are many others that, whose names just don't occur to me oh, right sure. now. Oh, sure. But uh, those two, certainly, I, I, would, uh, I would want to mention. Um, I always found Jane Kemp so very helpful. <coughs> uh, she, um, uh, her bark was worse than her bite <laughs> and uh, was just a, a very helpful person. Um, she was always uh, kind of over overpressed with things to do. Yeah. But um, if you just stayed in there, Jane would always help you too, and that that was always very nice. Um, who was the uh, the dean uh, who also was a uh, very active here in terms of uh, sports and whatnot? Uh, Plaster, Dean Plaster. Dean Plaster. I remember him very well, as uh, once again a very helpful person when I first came here, and who was willing to stop and. Uh, 
you know, answer your questions and talk to you and whatnot. A kindly humorous. Yes, very, very much so. Always could help make your day. Uh-huh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I remember him very well. And, um, oh, I, I mentioned Dr. Sullinger. Yes. Uh, he was a man who really didn't get the recognition that he deserved when he was on this campus, but uh, he was a, a very quiet, fine sociologist. A quiet scholar. Yes, he was. Yeah. A very, very fine. No, I think you've touched on a variety of people, mm -hmm. and I'm sure if we talked long enough, you'd come up with, with many more. Mm -hmm. But I think you've given us a very nice picture of your life at the university and the things that you feel are important, and some things you think that might be changed, too. I wanted to ask you, yeah. Yeah. too, George, about uh, your other part of life a little bit. Uh -huh. We touched on it lightly. You are a man of the cloth. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm and, a fiscal uh, priest. And mm -hmm. now as you've left the university in full-time force, you and I were talking before we began the recording, you're going to be involved, as you have been over the years, with that aspect of your life, too. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about your work in the priesthood and your work here and how they've complemented or bothered each other, how they work together. How's that been? Not too well, many people <coughs> do that sort of thing. They haven't uh, particularly complemented one another. They certainly haven't conflicted at all. Um, yeah, um, my um, my religious commitments are very important to me too, and I think that um, one of the, one of the reasons I decided to take my retirement when I did uh, was partly the buyout which the university offered. I thought it was awfully nice to be paid for not working. <laughs> uh, that was a, a generous thing to do, even though it's a, it's a small buyout. Nonetheless, it's, it's something that uh, very nice. Yeah. And uh, the other thing that offered me an opportunity to do was uh, to do a little bit of community service. I'm going to be working uh, with uh, Opera Omaha and the Omaha Symphony one day a week, just part-time, whatever, kind of a gopher kind of person, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Back and with then, the symphony you started with many years ago? Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 And then I'll um, uh, help uh, at uh, down Trinity Cathedral uh, two or three days a week as well. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to do this. I'm glad my health is still good enough to where I can uh, still um, you know, do these kinds of things because they're very important to me. You know, I ought to mention, you, um, one of the things that I did while I was out here that I haven't mentioned, uh -huh. Bob Woody and Evan um, Brown yes. and I formed a trio, a brass trio, uh, several years ago now, and uh, gave a, a recital, as a matter of fact, up here uh, at the music school, uh, a, a brass trio concert, and enjoyed that a great deal. We did that for about a year and a half, uh, uh, we three. And I, I, I would want to mention Evan, because uh, not merely because of his tragic death, but also because he was a, a fine French horn player. In many ways, he faced the same problems that I did. I debated, do I want to become a, a teacher, a scholar, and so on, or do I want to stay with music? And Evan uh, played in the San Francisco Symphony at times, mm -hmm. uh, when he, back when he was in school, and faced the same question. I know we often talked about that, that how different our life would have been had we chosen music. <clears throat> Uh, we both agreed that we made the right choice, that uh, well, that's music uh, does not pay that well. <laughs> but, uh, no. That sounds like an uh, enjoyable thing that you did as a Very part of your so. I've always work. enjoyed my music. I've enjoyed my music, and I've always enjoyed my, uh, my religious commitments. They've uh, added a great deal in my life. Yeah. I think you've often give, always given me the impression, George, of being a man who enjoys being busy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. But, uh, I um, well, I'm not work an op optimist, and it, it's good for me to. Uh, I, I get depressed yeah. if I have too much free time. So in a sense, it's a it's a defense mechanism yeah. on my part. To now retirement, busy. you think that's going to make a lot of difference in all of that? No, I don't think so. Uh, I expect to stay fairly busy. Sounds like it. I'll from probably teach summer so school. Uh, we've talked about that, and mm -hmm. that way I'll still have that interest in in college. But I won't have to stay up uh, in the literature. As I, uh, one of the reasons I did not take the part time was I really didn't want to stay up in the literature any longer. And I thought mm -hmm. this would, uh, uh, doing other things. If I've got the talents to do them. I might as well use them. And uh, I thought I would uh, uh, just uh, just cease teaching except for the introductory class. No, I expect to. I hope to stay busy, Paul. I think uh, you've been at this long enough now, George, so you can give other people advice. But turn the alarm off. That, that's the <laughs> yeah. one thing I want yeah. to do, where I don't yeah. have to necessarily get up early. I was going to ask you too, George, and it's nice to have this on tape, as you reflect on all these years of teaching and preaching and doing a variety of other things, that zero in on teaching. And if you were going to draw a picture of what you think is a good teacher, and you mentioned some whom you felt were good teachers, uh -huh. what would that picture include? What makes, in your opinion, over 
all these years of experience, a good, solid, acceptable, well-liked teacher. Well, to me, they have to, they have to stay up in their field. They must stay up in the literature. They must be willing to make that time commitment uh, that it takes uh, to spend time in the library and at research and so on to where you, you feel like that uh, you don't stay up in your field, as you know. It, it continually gets a little bit further away yeah. from you because it's just almost impossible. Yes. But uh, a person who does that, and that's one half of it, is so in terms of the person themselves, in terms of preparing for classes, that they, they revise their notes regularly. They don't depend upon just winging it mm -hmm. and so on. Then the other thing, I do think that they have to care about students. Uh, students can be uh, very rewarding. They can also be very baffling at times. And uh, you have to care enough about them that uh, you're willing to spend whatever time it takes uh, to try to, to, to find the student that needs help and uh, work with that student as well as look for the, for the outstanding student that you want to encourage and, and uh, give whatever extra help you know, to, to help them in a sense blossom and so on. Um, one of the great things about our university is that uh, we get students who have not been successful in their first college or go around, and then they've stayed out for a few years, and then they come back, and they're ready to study then. Well motivated. And we have to be ready for them. And uh, I think a good teacher is, and is willing to, to work with them and to, uh, uh, he or she are prepared well enough themselves that they can bring the resources that this student needs. Now, that, that's what I see in the ones that I've listed as good, stu uh, good teachers. Now, as you look back on all these years at this university where you've spent much of your life... Mm -hmm. I never thought it'd end up in Omaha. <laughs> no, neither did I. <laughs> um, I guess I would ask you on a very personal basis as we close this tape out uh, what the university has meant to you and Helen personally. Well... You hmm. can't speak for Helen, I guess, but let's ask you. No, Helen's always enjoyed her association with the uh, faculty wives. She's, uh, that's meant a lot to her. And, my wife uh, has. Uh, she's really gotten well acquainted with several of them. Uh, to me, uh, it's the, uh, first the opportunity to teach uh, that this university has, has offered in um, uh, a, a good environment, an environment that, uh, that gives you the freedom. I've never felt any kind of constraint in any of my classes here that I couldn't teach what I wanted to teach as I wanted to teach it and so on. Um, most of the time, the resources uh, have been a little bit less than adequate, but uh, nonetheless, the university has tried to provide good resources. Um, and I suppose that uh, those are the things I most enjoyed about teaching. I suppose I ought to say one of the things that I've really felt so, uh, you know, as I look back over my career now, I think I've been very fortunate that uh, in my own work career, I've always had a job. Yeah. And I think that um, that's so important. Uh, I, I think it must be devastating uh, for people who uh, are prepared and so on, who aren't able to find jobs at times. So I think that's one thing I always uh, think about. Well, I've been very fortunate. And we're fortunate, I think, <laughs> as a university to have had you, George. Well, thank you. And I appreciate your taking time to be with me and doing this uh, hour pleasure. of reflection. My pleasure, Paul. Here in the winter of 1988 in the Hyper Building, Dr. George Barger and I have been reflecting. In the program we call, in the series we've come to call, Reflections in Time.